Hey, hey, everybody. Hello, everyone. My name is Ashley Yvonne, and I'm the founder of a movement entitled Drop Everything and Pray, where we change our lives by acting boldly in prayer. And tonight, I wanted to jump on really quickly and do this phenomenal teaching. Hey, Dawn, if you are not familiar with me, again, my name is Ashley Yvonne, and I specialize in helping faith-based women take a stand against narcissistic abuse, using prayer. I started a movement called Drop Everything and Pray as a result of my own personal experience with uh, narcissism in the pulpit in particular. And so I'm running the game. I'm about to expose the enemy tonight. All right. So y'all do me a favor, share, shout out to my Instagram people. Thank you so much for jumping on. My Facebook family is about to jump on here. I am so excited to just, um, just help some women today. Could y'all help me help some women? Could y'all share this with as many people as possible today. This uh, live is about um, in particular, the top three types of women that are targeted by narcissistic preachers. I'm going to define for you today what a narcissistic preacher is. And then I'm also going to define for you all uh, those particular qualities that they look for in their victims. And so if that sounds like something that would be of benefit to you all, do me a favor and share this with as many women as you possibly can. Okay. Period. And so I want to jump on, um, and just say, Hey, to some people, uh, please share. Okay. Please share, please share, please share, uh, share this with as many women as possible. Um, if you're seeing my face for the first time on uh, this here Instagram, I don't come live on Instagram frequently. I'm going to start doing that. Um, how at you girl. Hey, how y'all doing? Let's go. Okay. Let's go. Let's do it. So we're going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time. God, we thank you for this teaching. We thank you for this moment to be able to honor you, to worship you, to bring clarity uh, to, to what you are doing in the earth, Lord. Um, you don't want us to be deceived. And so, Father, we thank you that you are uh, illuminating all the dark places that exist in our minds, all the all the darkness, the ignorance that exists, uh, things that we have believed that were not true all of our lives. God, we thank you that you're shining the light on that. And God, we thank you that you are making a way out of no way. We thank you that you are everything we need, hope for, and desire. You are the lover of our souls. You are a king's man, redeemer. You are just everything we need, God. And so we just take a minute to say thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much uh, for what you're doing in our lives. All right, y'all. Maya's in the house. Shania's in the house. Karen's in the house. My sister Mary's in the house. Um, Bake Jr. is in the house on Instagram. Odell, what's up? Have not seen you in years in the house. Y'all say hello to me so I can know who's in the house. Where are you chiming in from? My Aunt Tanya's over here on Facebook. Hey, Auntie, how are you? I love y'all, period. So let's jump into the teaching because I'm going to get on later tonight to pray as well. And so we want to make sure that um, I have adequate uh, break time in between that. And so today's topic is the top three uh, female victims of the narcissistic preacher. And so before I talk about uh, who their potential victims are, I want to actually define what a narcissistic preacher is actually is. I'm going to move this over so I can see my notes here. Okay. I'm going to define what a narcissistic preacher actually is. So first I want to define what a narcissist is. A narcissist is a person who has an excessive interest in or admiration of themselves. I want y'all to take notes as we're doing this. Okay. Take notes. If I say anything that that hits you, like that, you know what I'm saying? Just make just make sure that you jot it in the chat so we know we're following along. So that's a narcissist, a person who's basically wants admires themselves. They want everyone to admire them as well. A preacher is one whose function is to preach sermons. And the word preach means to urge acceptance or abandonment of an idea or a course of action. And so the reason why um, I explicitly named it as a narcissistic preacher is because every preacher is not a Christian. I'll say that again. The reason why I am ex I am um, distinctly defining a narcissistic preacher and not a narcissistic Christian because every preacher is not a Christian. 
Okay. And so for tonight, we're defining a narcissistic preacher is a person who preaches sermons as a means to seduce, to charm, to manipulate others using false doctrine with an outcome related to interests of themselves. Karen said, I'm preaching already. <laughs> I'm teaching already. Okay. I'll say it again. A narcissistic preacher is a person who preaches sermons as a means to seduce, charm, manipulate others using a false doctrine with the outcome that is related to self-interest. Why is this important for you all to know? Well, the Bible says in the last day, many are going to be deceived. Okay. Many are going to be deceived. And so one of the tools that narcissistic preachers use is before I get to the point about the top three women that they that they target, male narcissistic preachers target in particular, okay? One of the tools that they use is flattery. Flattery, meaning excessive compliments. You all know it as love bombing, right? Flattery. What does the Bible explicitly say about flattery? The Bible says in Proverbs 29, five through six, that a person who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for him to step into. To an evil person, sin is bait in a trap, but a righteous person runs away from it and is glad. And so the person who flatters is actually spreading a net for your feet. Well, imagine you trying to walk through a net, a walking through a net is 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 a, it's a, a destabilizing experience you're, you're wavering you you feel and trust right karen said entrapment that's right and so it is a way to to trap you it, it's a, remember we talked about seduction right narcissistic preachers seduce one of the way they seduce is through flattery if you are a woman in particular who has trouble with affirming yourself you are can easily fall victim to these types of preachers remember every preacher is not a christian okay uh, psalms 36 1 through 3 it says an oracle within my heart concerning the trespass, the trust, the transgression, sorry, of the wicked person. There is no dread of God before his eyes. They have no fear of God. For in his own eyes, he flatters himself too much to discover and hate his sin. My God, today. The words of his mouth are malicious and deceptive. He has stopped acting wisely and doing good. Again, we are we are charting the path. We're building the foundation. Before we can even talk about the top three targets for narcissistic preachers, we have to define what a narcissistic preacher is. If you're just chiming in, the definition of a narcissistic preacher is a person who preaches sermons as a means to seduce charm and manipulate others using false doctrine with an outcome related to self-interest. Somebody say it's all about them. Okay. It's all about them. If I'm blessed, you put some fire in the chat, say something, share this with somebody. I'm going to share this to a group right now. Okay. I'm, I'm finna share this because I want somebody to get this. Y'all share this because we want somebody to get that. All right. So top three victims of the narcissistic preacher, those of you all who've been following me for any amount of time, if you want to know my story, you can find out my story on my website, www.ashleyvine.org. Okay. If you click about, you go to about, you will read a quick synopsis of uh, my story. Um, I believe there's a video on that page as well for you to actually listen to uh, the detailed account of my experience with this. All right. Yes, it's all about them. All right, so narcissistic preacher, preacher sermons, right? As a means to seduce, to charm, to manipulate others using a false doctrine with an outcome that is related to self-interest. So the first thing they typically do is they utilize flattery. They're setting a the trap for your feet. And so ladies, that's why affirming yourself is important because any hole that you have that has not been filled by the Holy Spirit, the devil himself will try to, will try to complete that. Void. The second thing they use is a, is a facade. Facade is defined as an outward appearance that is maintained to conceal a less pleasant or credible reality. Okay. A facade. The Bible talks about that. You know, they in on the inside, they are ravenous wolves. I got to look up that scripture. Okay. So here's some tools, some strategies, some things. Again, for those of y'all who are just chiming in on Facebook, 
and on Instagram. We are charting the path. We are actually defining what a narcissistic preacher is first. And then we are talking about explicitly uh, what, hey, Deandra, we're talking about explicitly what are the three types of women that these types of preachers are. Uh, uh, attack or they uh, go after as prey. Okay. Every preacher is not a Christian. I'll say it again. Every preacher is not a Christian. A, a preacher is just someone who convinces someone of something else. There's a reason why I said uh, uh, that uh, the top three women that are targeted by not a narcissistic Christian, but a narcissistic preacher, because every preacher is not a Christian, even if they talk about Christ. All right. So Here's some scripture to help, you know, undergird the truth. All right. That means you need to go and read these scriptures for yourself. First one is second Peter two and one. It says, but false prophets who arose among the people, right? Among the church, among the prayer meeting. Okay. Among the youth bowling engagement, among the, the skating rally, the skating fundraiser at the church. But false prophets also arose where? Among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, listen to this, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing unto themselves swift destruction. Again, we're charting the path. Every preacher is not a Christian, okay? Galatians 5, 16 through 26. Y'all drop these scriptures in the chat so we know you're following along. Galatians 5, 16 through 26. But I say, walk by the spirit that you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. How are you able to identify a narcissistic preacher? Are they uh, showing fruits of the flesh, desires of the flesh? The Bible is clear. What are those things? Galatians 5, 16 through 26 says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh because these oppose each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So this is for all, you know, the uh, the Pharisaic, uh, you know, religious people who have a form of godliness, but deny the power they of. They say, we are no longer under the law. The Bible says, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. But if you are led by the flesh and because of the flesh reaps destruction, um, you finna be under that law because you're not walking in the spirit. Okay, help us out here, saints. Y'all share this, tag some sisters. I need y'all to tag some women up in here, up in here, all right? If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of flesh are evident. That word evident means it is obvious to you. It is obvious to you. A lot of you all, you know that it is obvious to you that these people are operating in their flesh, but you try because you have been trained by the, the, the fear of man and by the doctrine of man to ignore what is evident. The Bible says the work of the flesh is evident, are evident. It is, it is obvious, it's in your face. Then he gave us a whole list, okay? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, riv rivalries, dissensions, divisions, all these things, characteristics of narcissistic people and especially narcissistic preachers. All right, last scripture here, Hebrews 10 and 26. If we go on sinning deliberately, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. It's in the Bible, Hebrews 10, 26, right? And so those, remember, we are defining narcissistic preachers because every preacher is not a Christian. And so our definition tonight for narcissistic preacher is a person who preaches sermons as a means to seduce, charm, and manipulate. It sounds sexy to be able, you know, to cuss people out and still feel like you're going to heaven. That's seductive, right? That feels good. It feels good to be able to, you know, get drunk and, and have orgies and do all these things um, and, and still feel a sense of peace because we're, we're not held to the law anymore, right? That's seductive. That's that's sexy to be able to cuss somebody out and still get in the pulpit, right? It's 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 a sexy, seductive thing to be able to live a double life, to have a, you know, you a man, you got a boyfriend and a wife, 
You know what I'm saying? You a woman, you got a girlfriend and a husband. And you know, it's it's a sexy thing. It is seductive to be able to feel like you could do whatever you want and have no consequences for it. All right. So narcissistic preacher is a person who preaches sermons as a means to seduce, charm, manipulate others using false doctrine, <laughs> DeAndre said Jesus, with an outcome related to self-interest. We have already defined narcissistic preacher already. Um, and because every preacher is not a Christian, a preacher is just someone who persuades you to do something or to not do something. That is what a preacher is, right? There's a reason why I didn't say narcissistic Christian or narcissistic pastor or narcissistic apostle. I said a narcissistic preacher, someone who utilizes sermons. So that could be a, a, a bishop, an apostle, a deacon or anything um, in order to seduce and manipulate people. Hey, Sierra, I see you in here. So every inquiring minds want to know, okay? Inquiring minds wants to know, what are the top three victims of the narcissistic preacher? What do y'all think? Tell me in the chat. Yes. She said, this is very heavy, but go sis. <laughs> That's right. We got to do it. Um, hey, y'all. Again, let me reset. I feel like I'm on Clubhouse. Hey, my name is Ashley Yvonne. I am a Christian life coach. I specialize in helping faith-based women bounce or take a stand against narcissistic abuse using prayer. Okay. I do that through a prayer movement that I started about a year and a half ago called Drop Everything and Pray, where we change our lives by acting boldly in prayer. And tonight, we are unpacking and defining what a narcissistic preacher is and also what the top three victims of a narcissistic preacher um, consists of. There, there are three types of women that these types of preachers target intentionally with the purpose of seducing and charming with an area of, of self-interest. Okay, here we go. Yes. One with the good heart that's loving, right? Uh, the one who's also uh, uh, thinks that they have to perform to be loved. But I was able to, to, to break them down into categories, but you you guys are on it. Yes, prophetic. See, ever said impasse, prophetic. What other types of women do you think these people target? Uh, Van said the one with the good heart that's loving and forgiving. Thank you. Right. Yes. Prophetic. Why prophetic? Well, uh, people who operate in narcissism are actually operating in the spirit of Jezebel and Jezebel hates prophet. And so if you are a woman, and you find yourself with a narcissistic man. Nine times out of ten, you have some type of prophetic in you. It's either you're operating in the office of a prophet. You are an intercessor um, or something of that sort. That's one of the clues as to as to who you are. All right. So the very first victim of a narcissistic preacher i'm gonna put i want y'all to drop it in the chat hashtag the church girl let's put that in there hashtag the church girl why what is a church girl well a church girl is a woman who spent the vast majority of her childhood and adolescence in church um meaning not just in church attending church uh, I'm well, Walter, not just in or attending church, but also actively involved in church for the entirety of her life, whether it be choir or dance or ushering or something of some sort. Hashtag the church girl. That is its first type of woman that the narcissistic preacher targets. Why is that? Well, the church girl, uh, if you are a church girl, it is highly likely that you have been already indoctrinated with the traditions of man, meaning that there's a certain tradition in terms of how women should operate in a religious space that they are already aware of. They have already been manipulated to a degree by a doctrine that opposes the word of God. And so they are easier to fulfill. Yes, uh, Sierra said, because they are sheltered. That is right. I'm going to dig into that a little bit as well. They are sheltered. That was me. That was in that category, the church girl. Uh, why else does a narcissistic preacher choose a church girl? That's right. Karen said naive, assumes that all men in leadership are safe emotionally, spiritually, or physically. It was me. I know a lot of y'all gave y'all panties up because y'all were naive. I did it. Okay. Yes. Van said me. Okay. I did it. Gave the panties up because you don't know no better because nobody taught you any better. Right. They just they just they just kept you on a choir stand and they thought that was going to be enough protection. And it wasn't. 
All right, the church girl. We're talking about again, three victims of narcissistic preachers. Sierra said that was me. Van said that was me. Okay, we didn't know any better. Why else? Hey, Becky, why else does the narcissistic preacher uh, target the church girl, hashtag the church girl, because they are ignorant about the nuances of sexuality? Well, why is that? If anyone who has been a church girl, you know that there's a purity culture that says, do not have sex. Absolutely do not have sex. And if you do have sex, lie and say you didn't have sex because then you are perceived as loose, okay? You are loose. If you say anything about sex, if you are sexual or sensual in any way, um, you know, that is a part of purity culture that church girls are indoctrinated with. Why else, right? Uh, are church girls ignorant about the nuances of sexuality? They don't often learn about the biology behind sex. What is What happens to your body physically? What are the chemical reactions? How are the endorphins activated in your mind when you engage in sexual activity, right? No one teaches you that. If you are a church girl, you're ignorant about the nuances of sexuality. What else? Why else are church girls ignorant of sexuality? Another reason, soul ties are only taught in the context of sex. Well, if you do any research on your own, you find out you can have a soul tie to an organization just through association. You can get a soul tie through conversation, consistent conversation. Anything that builds intimacy can build a soul tie. But church girls are often taught that only sex is what solidifies a soul tie. That is not true. That is why they become a prime target for narcissistic preachers because they are sheltered. They are ignorant about the nuances of sexuality. They assume that all men in leadership are safe and they have already been indoctrinated with the traditions of man. If I'm helping you, say you're helping me in the chat. I mean, seriously. Hey, Karen, Sierra, Becky's still on here, I pray. So, the very first victim of a narcissistic preacher is the church girl, okay? The second uh, victim of the narcissistic preacher is the perfectionist or that strictly business girl, okay? The perfectionist or the strictly business girl. Well, why is that the perfectionist? Well, narcissists, remember, are primarily concerned with their self-interest. And so someone who is a perfectionist always wants to get it right. That woman who was a businesswoman, who was about her business and uh, is a perfectionist in some way, who has worked up the corporate ladder, who is highly educated and does well in her corporate career or on her, on her entrepreneurial pursuits, she is prey to being uh, or she is potentially vulnerable to a, a narcissistic preacher because she may not be as religious, but she still has some of those gaps in terms of relationships because she's so, so focused on business, right? The strictly business. So the first uh, type of big uh, a victim, potential victim of a narcissistic preacher is a church girl. The second one is the perfectionist or the strictly business, right? Also, as a result of the narcissist association with this strictly business woman, um, they get a sense of their ego being stroked, which we know to be called narcissistic supply. They get narcissistic supply by being able to say, man, I'm, I'm, I'm messing with this girl, she a lawyer right? I'm messing with this girl and you know she makes six figures a month, right All of that, is to boost and to massage the ego, which is food for the narcissist. If I'm helping you say you're helping me, the first a type of victim of a narcissistic preacher is a church girl. The second victim of a narcissistic preacher is a perfectionist or the strictly business, right? And the third, the third, somebody say the third. The third type of victim of a narcissistic preacher is the wayward right? The girl who, you know, some would say is a diamond in the rough. The girl who had a hard life and hard uh, background. The the one in, in the black community you would deem as the ride or die chick, right? The wayward, the one 
who is who has a background maybe in a promiscuous lifestyle or um, maybe in drugs or something like that, where she's 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 not completely still in that lifestyle, but she she's pulled away from it enough to be able to try to you know you know search for God a little bit for herself, and you know she's still trying to figure out this God thing. Hey, Doctor Kishma, um, trying to figure out this God thing, and so she's in this you know this transitional phase. Van said that was me, right? And so the reason why they often utilize this or they target this type of woman, the wayward, is because they have a sense of loyalty. They have this undying loyalty. And that is what narcissists need in order to survive. They need someone who's going to constantly fuel it. And remember, narcissists get food from attention. They love drama and they love trauma. OK, and so the wayward is a woman who has a lot of trauma. Maybe she had a lot of sexual abuse or there were a lot of things that were happening for her as a child. And so they, they utilize that as fuel and they and they poke at those different vulnerabilities in order to extract uh, what they ultimately want, uh, which is worship to be completely transparent. Narcissistic preachers uh, want worship. They want you to see them as God. And when you submit yourself to them, you yourself become an idolater of a sort because you put, you prioritize their needs. You prioritize their perceptions. You uh, you prioritize uh, what they want over, not even just what God wants, but what is best for you as well. Again, if you guys are just chiming in, my name is Ashley Yvonne. I'm the founder of the movement, Drop Everything and Pray. And I am a Christian life coach. I specialize in helping faith-based women take a stand against narcissistic abuse using prayer. Okay. So I teach you about abuse, narcissistic abuse in particular. And I also teach you about prayer. And tonight, 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 we talked about the top three victims of the narcissistic preacher we define tonight. We defined it. Okay. We define, Hey Kai, the narcissistic preacher is a person who preaches sermons as a means to seduce, to charm and to manipulate others using false doctrine with an outcome that is related to self-interest. So that self-interest could be money. That self-interest could be sex. That self-interest could be, I want you to be my lifelong side chick. There are preachers who intentionally have women who have committed to be on lifelong side chicks, 20 and 30 years, lifelong side chicks, right? Not because it is fuel for them. It is never enough. One woman is never enough for the narcissist. And so if you are with one nine times out of 10, uh, infidelity is just a part of what it means to be in relationship with or married to a narcissist. Okay. Okay. Now I have said a lot. So I'm wondering if anyone has any questions for the kid, for me. Does anyone have any questions for me as it relates to this particular topic? Van said, yep. Uh, Becky is still back on. Hey, Becky, still in the place. Karen, I, I believe, is still on. I can't see how many people are on over on Facebook. Eight people over here on Facebook. Thank you so much for jumping on. I mean, seriously. Come on, y'all. Let's do it. All right. Um, let's do it. So what questions? Let me just go back to make sure that I'm able to see them really quickly. What questions do you all have for me? What questions do you have? Let me go back into the comments. All right. Y'all let me know if y'all have any questions. If y'all have any questions for me, if y'all have any questions for me, mm -mm. what questions do you have for me? Mm -mm -mm -mm. What questions do you have for me? Ba, 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 ba. What questions do you have for me? Hey, hey, hey. What questions do you have for me? Mm -mm 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 -mm. What questions do you have for me? Yeah, what questions do you have for me? Let's see what questions you got for me. Okay, let me plug up something. I got to plug up my iPad. My iPad's over here on Instagram. Hey, Instagram. Um, Deandra, and does anyone have any questions um, for me? Anyone have any questions for me? Um, again, the first target is the church girl. 
The second target is the perfectionist, the strictly business. The third target is the wayward. Okay, those are the three types of women that male narcissistic preachers target um, to seduce, manipulate, and control with um, an area of self interest. All right, any questions, Maya? Any questions? Hey, Alexis, I see you here on Instagram. Thank you so much for joining. Um, hey, sis, y'all, uh, if y'all just jumping on, we defined a narcissistic preacher as a, a person who preaches sermons as a means to seduce, charm, and manipulate others using false doctrine with an outcome related to self-interest. Okay. Hey, now, related to uh, self-interest. And so now the floor is open. We talked about those three uh, types of women that narcissistic male preachers in particular target. It is the church girl, the perfectionist, and the wayward. All right. Some women have already put, you know, their comments here in the chat about how that resonates with them. Looking at comments here on Facebook. Okay. Well, if no one has any questions, any questions for me in particular as it relates to my experience or what we were talking about. So Van here, she put in the chat here on Facebook. She said, my ex cheated on me with three different women. The first one he had was in a cycle for 22 years since they were 13 and is still dealing with him today while he has a new woman. What makes a woman stay in a toxic relationship for so long? Thank you so much for sharing that. And so when we talk about staying in a toxic relationship for so long, you have to think about it as um, a, a, a form of addiction. You have become addicted to this person. In psychology, they call that a trauma bond. Okay? You have a trauma bond with them. Yes. Um, and so because of that, your, your mind, your will, your emotions a trauma bond, a type of soul tie, right? You're entangled in your soul with this person. And so even when they are away from you, um, you are addicted to them, right? It's kind of like those of you all who are, who are who are working on detoxing and doing better on your diet. You know, the, the um, a lot of research says that sugar is likened to a cocaine addiction, I believe it says, right? Because you are craving something because it's familiar to you and it feels good even if it isn't good. It feels great if you love Pepsi to drink it every single day. But that same Pepsi can clean the toilet, right? And so it feels good. It is uh, seducing to your senses. That's what narcissism is all about. And so you are addicted to it. And so for, in order for you... To, to break that addiction from this person, you have to develop a new appetite. The Bible, one of the, the father had uh, led me to do some research on the brain and how, you know, um, he, particular neuroplasticity, how thoughts are intermingled and how thoughts create cravings and how your stomach actually sends transmitters or information to your brain um, to tell your to tell your brain that you're hungry and then you start to manifest symptoms of a craving. It's the same thing when you're in a toxic relationship. So that's why you have to be intentional about creating a new appetite. One of the definitions of mind is the seat of your appetites. My God, ain't this good Instagram? I mean, hello. One of the definitions of your mind is the seat of the appetite. I'm gonna see if I can find those. I don't think I have those notes anywhere. Hold on. Let me see if I got them anywhere for y'all. Let me see if I can help the church, help build a church. One of the definitions, oh, I don't have it. One of the definitions of your mind is the seat of your appetite. And so when you finally break connection with someone who you had a toxic relationship with, 
but you still follow them on social media, you are still feeding a toxic appetite. When you break the connection with a toxic person and you still engage in conversations involving your feelings, you are feeding a toxic appetite. You're addicted. It's an addiction. I'm going to let that sit on y'all. You have to develop a new appetite for something else. When you are developing, and Laura's on here, she recently changed her diet, right? And so when you are, a, or when you're trying to develop a new palate for something, initially it tastes disgusting. Being alone with your thoughts after you've been in a toxic relationship don't taste good. Hey, fabulous over your Instagram. It doesn't taste good. Dealing with your childhood trauma that caused you to get into a narcissistic relationship does not taste good. Hmm. And so in order for you, that's why women in particular struggle to break that narcissistic bond or relationship because you have to acknowledge the fact that you are addicted. You have to acknowledge the fact that that person is an idol in your life. And God is very clear about what he feels about idols. Let's do some Google searching. I'm going to actually type into Google. What does the Bible say about idols? What does the Bible hold on Instagram say about idols? We're going to research it together. Let's look at it. He says, Exodus 23 through six, he tells the children of Israel, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water or under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and who keep my commandments. How I'm interpreting that is, if you have an idol that you put before God, that means you hate God. Ooh. That's a harsh reality. Your actions are sending a signal to God that you hate him. When you have an idol, anything that you put before God in his place. First John 5 and 21, little children, keep yourself from idols. Steadfast, okay? Isaiah 44, 9. Through 20, all who fashions, all who fashion idols are nothing and the things they delight in do not profit. Doesn't that sound like being in a relationship with a narcissist? I remember when I was married, I used, there were certain things that I used to love. Poetry was one of them. Slowly but surely stopped engaging in poetry and poetry. The thing that I used to delight in, it didn't even profit me anymore because I had fashioned an idol in my heart. I idolize this person's opinion over the opinion of God. I idolize this person's, um, you know, just presence in my life over the presence of God in my life. And so because of that, it profited me nothing. Am I, am I helping anybody here? Can I help anybody? So tonight, I want to know if anyone else has any more questions. We talked about, one, we defined what a narcissistic preacher is. Okay? Hey, Trebia, because every preacher is not a Christian. Okay? Every preacher is not a Christian. Instagram, if y'all have questions, let me know. All right? Every preacher is not a Christian. And so there's a reason why, no problem, Becky. There's a reason why I said a narcissistic preacher and not a narcissistic prophet or a narcissistic apostle or narcissistic pastor, a narcissistic preacher, because a preacher is just a person 
who is able to use sermons to urge you to do something or to not do something. That's what a preacher is. And so a narcissistic preacher is a person who preaches sermons as a means to seduce, charm, and manipulate others using false doctrine with an outcome that is related to self-interest. And today we are targeting the male narcissistic preacher and we also are exposing the types of women that they target. The first type is a church girl. The second type is a perfectionist with a strictly busy on the business. And then the third type is the wayward. I'm actually in a beginning phases of writing a book on this. And so stay tuned. All right. So does anyone else have any more questions for me as it relates to my own personal experience with this, as well as um, any questions about what I've shared thus far? If I were to pick which category I found myself in, it would be the church girl because I was sheltered. I learned purity culture. We actually had a ceremony at church where, you know, you commit yourselves, your body to God and you get this purity ring. Um, and then most people who are part of the purity group ended up being teenage mothers anyways, because uh, me, me having a ceremony and walking down the aisle and having a pretend marriage to the Lord without being informed about where my position is as a bride of Christ does nothing. It's a form of godliness, but it denies the power thereof. Are we telling the truth today? I mean, seriously, does anyone have any questions? Because I, I just, you know, we just won't put it out there. It doesn't help. So I would say I was in the church girl category. What category were you guys in? If you were, if you were found yourself, unfortunately, in a, in a intimate relationship with a narcissist, it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. It could be a friendship. It could be, you know, a spiritual leader, um, anyone. Okay. Where'd you find yourself in? Were you the church girl? Were you the perfectionist or strictly business type? Or were you the wayward? You were the, what they call the ratchet, the diamond in the rough, right? Which, which one were you? So we can we can unpack that just a little bit. Instagram. Hey, Instagram, Instagram, the lighting on Instagram. I mean, seriously. Does anyone else have any more questions? If not, we will get on up off of here. You know what I'm saying? If y'all could just drop a share of this to someone, that would be cool as well. You know. That would totally be cool. Any more questions for me? Any questions? Maya says, I want to read this. Uh -huh. Becky said all three. Laura said I was definitely the church girl, also perfectionist and a wayward. <laughs> yes. Uh, Trivia said the wayward. Karen said the perfectionist. Maya said I was a church girl and the wayward. Being in a narcissistic relationship kind of all of my life, which these cycles came from childhood, never knew that there was a term narcissist for toxicity. I've been brought down, self-esteem, um, had left, laughed, talked about, cheated on, etc. Through prayer, God has shown me that I had let a lot of people go, um, that I had to let a lot of people go. And a prayer has been changing a lot for me. Amen. Uh, Trivia told me to explain more about the wayward. So the wayward is the woman. Hey, lovely Charlotte, 19. Thanks for joining um, here on Instagram. So the wayward is a woman who has a rocky history. Maybe she grew up in foster care or, you know, it's a bit of a diamond in the rough, more uh, a person who is, is more rough or rugged around the edges, had a hard life. And is at a point in her life where she's trying to make a turn and she's, she's finding God, but she didn't grow up in church. She doesn't know church. And so because of that, her vulnerability is found in the fact that she doesn't she doesn't know a lot about Christianity or church in particular. And so she is vulnerable because she can also be in a space where she assumes that every man in church is safe because she came from the streets. And so because, you know, you know, that kind of mentality. Hope that makes sense. I want to hash this out a bit, too. Yes, I want to uh, circle back. A lot of women on here are saying that they were either all three or the perfectionists. Yes, um, they build you up to put you down, only to build you back up to keep you. Yes. Um, 
Van said she was practicing. Listen to this. I want to talk about the sex piece too. Van said, I was practicing abstinence for two years and four months. And he said that was one thing that attracted him to me. I lost that February this year. Biggest mistake, but I'm back on track. Amen. Thank God. And we just, we just prophesy that any shame that the enemy will try to bring upon you, that is, you know, we, we don't, we don't accept any shame. The Bible says for your shame, you shall have double. And the fact that you're able to confess your sins to a bunch of people who don't even know you says that you're in a posture of repentance and that God is super, certainly pleased with that. The Bible says he who covers his sins will not prosper. Okay, period. Amen. So here's the thing about sex, right? If you are the church girl and you are unaware because you grew up in purity culture and, and me, I was a church girl. I didn't know how men talked you out of your panties. Like I didn't know how they did that. Like, I thought, you know, they would just come out and just say, I want to have sex with you. Like, that's what I thought they would do. But what they really do is they study what you say and what you do. They also test you with proximity. Y'all follow me, church girls? Okay. So that's why as a woman, you have to be very selective about what, how much information you disclose to a man that you just met, you do not know, because in his mind... He coming up with a whole map of how he finna chart his way to your gates to help you enter his gate. Okay. Yes. Yeah, smooth talk me right out of them. Every y'all know what I'm talking about. They will smooth talk you right on out your panties. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. Smooth talk you right on up out your panties. I didn't got bamboozled before. Okay. A time or two or three or four or five. Okay. Bamboozled just right on out the drawers. And here's the thing. They know that, you know, the there, there's like a naive nature, right, that a church girl has. And so you don't know to, to create spatial boundaries necessarily. Um, or if you do, listen to this, as a church girl, that mentality of always being perfect and always doing what's going to make you feel accepted. And if anyone shows you any type of rejection, you tend to, again, because church girls have been indoctrinated with the traditions of man and the fear of man and what people think of them. And so because of that, these types of men, they play on your vulnerability as it relates to wanting to be accepted. And so slowly but surely, they try to slowly, you know, weasel their way in by one, listening to what you say. And so if you, if a man asks you, what do you like in a man? And you telling him everything specifically. I like when a man texts me in the morning. I like when he gives me flowers. I like when he talks about God. I like when he's a prayer warrior. He gonna be all those things until he get to draws, dog. Like Tommy on Martin says, okay? I got the draws, dog. That's what, that's what Tommy on Martin says, okay? So he going to do all of, he going to have a great performance until he gets the draws, dog. Right? Um, Maya said, I wanted that love and attention and that's what I was missing. And they can smell that. Right? They can smell that. If you do not practice self-care and awareness, if you do not speak to yourself every day, Telling yourself you're beautiful. It shouldn't be a surprise when a man comes to you and say, oh, you're so beautiful. You can say thank you, but it's not fuel that you're waiting to perform to so he can tell you you're beautiful again. I'm like, okay, what's new, right? Like you can't be impressed by that. Becky, have you seen the narcissist set boundaries with the opposite sex only to find out they those weren't the boundaries they were following, just one of you two? So Becky, um, do you mean that if you're with a narcissist, they want you to set boundaries with the opposite sex, but they don't um, set those same boundaries with the opposite sex? Is that what you're saying, Be Becky? Let me know. I just want to make sure I got your question right. Brittany, girl, my friend Brittany is on here. She taught on prayer and mental health at the Drop Everything and Pray conference uh, in no November 12th and 13th this, this year. Y'all, a couple weeks ago, sis, I mean, seriously. Yes, Becky said yes. Um, 
Brittany, so we defined the uh, narcissistic preacher because uh, every preacher is not a Christian. So I didn't say narcissistic Christian. I said narcissistic preacher uh, is a person who preaches sermons and as a means to seduce, charm and manipulate others using false doctrine with an outcome that is related to self-interest. And we just start talking about sex and how they just want the draws, dog. And Becky just asked a question around how they have a double standard. All narcissists have a double standard. They have a standard for how they, they will be treated and how they will not be treated. However, they will not respect any of your boundaries or standards. That is how you are able to, to, to decide whether or not, or just to be really discerning of any potential red flags. If you're in a relationship with someone who has all these tight standards, but they don't follow any of your standards, that's a red flag. Hey, Elder Fletcher, how art thou? All right. And we talked about the three types of women in particular that narcissistic preachers target. It is the church girl, the strictly business or professional, and then the wayward, also known as what we call, people will call ratchet, right? The one who's rough around the edges, had a lot going on and are like trying to get it together a little bit, you know. Any questions for me here on Instagram? Any questions for me here on Facebooks? As one of the mothers says, Facebooks. She said, y'all always on that Facebooks. I said, we on here trying to teach the people, mother, so they don't be deceived, mother. Facebooks. All right. Any more questions for me as it relates to uh, it being in relationship with, uh, going through a divorce from, a narcissistic preacher in particular. Um, yes. Uh, Brittany says, want to piss off or annoy a narcissist said and maintain boundaries. Do not budge on your boundaries. Absolutely. We have to maintain your boundaries. Setting them is not enough. You have to maintain them. I completely agree. They want you to relax your boundaries. And here's the thing. They always try to sneakily get you to relax your boundaries during vulnerable times of the year. Your birthday, holidays, your kid's day, uh, all those types of times. You know, so this is a great time of year for you to make sure you are holding fast to your boundaries if you are in relationship with or have children with a narcissist. Tighten up those boundaries. If your boundary has always been, we only text to communicate, it needs to stay that way. So when they try to get you on the phone, nah, put it on the app, period. Maintain the boundary. And you may, and you're not going to be perfect, but you have to remember. And narcissists are very tricky. You know, they, they try to catch you off guard to see if you're going to maintain. So sometimes you may slip because for a second you think that they are a normal person and they are not. Everything they do, they are gathering intel to try to destroy you. I'm just going to tell you the truth. All right. So back to these comments. Trivia, public attention is very different than behind the scene. Yes, when I was married, I cannot tell you the elaborate Facebook statuses that went up about me. And I was like, who is he talking about? Because he don't even like me. <laughs> oh, Lord. I was like, I can laugh at it now. I was just like, that was a mess. Child, I had these elaborate statuses, honey. You, you, you the peanut butter to my jelly. Meanwhile, at home, you walk in the house and don't even speak to me. OK, it is a dual reality out in these streets. Um, public, a different. Yes. Uh, they won't respect anything you say, do or think. They are all about themselves. Yes. Um, you have to maintain your boundaries. Um, Van said, what advice can you give someone trying to get out? The first thing you need to do is reprioritize the reason why a narcissist has uh, so much power in your life is because you gave it to them. You give them your emotional currency. Some of you, you give them your financial currency. You give them your thought currency. Yes, they lie all the time. Okay. And so the biggest thing is to reprioritize. The biggest thing for me, when I actually just spent all of my time prioritizing my relationship with God, it became easier and easier to detox. Remember, uh, toxic relationships are a type of addiction. 
Okay, you have an appetite for abuse. If you've been in a nar if you've been in any toxic relationship for a long period of time, you have an appetite for being treated in a particular way. It has become your normal, even though it is is it's toxic for you. Right? If you're a person who loves Pepsi and the doctor keeps telling you you can't drink Pepsi every day because you are diabetic and you keep doing it because it, your brain is addicted addicted to a type of response. And even if it's not good for you, you keep going back for it because you have acquired an appetite for the abuse. So the first thing you need to do in order to change your appetite, you have to reprioritize and you have to actually feed the right things. You have to feed on the right things. I started, I literally cleaned out a closet in my bedroom, not lying, put scriptures on the wall. I created a vision board. And I, I just started praying. That was the only thing I knew how to do at the time. I was so broken. I was so whatever. At the time, I had a miscarriage. The entire ministry that I was a part of, everyone turned on me um, and started to embrace the mistress. Um, and it was just crazy. And I was like, yo, like, what's good? What, like, how am I finna get out of this? And, and not go to jail. Okay. Now, I did cuss and I did bust windows out of cars and I did get drunk when I first found out. I'm just going to tell y'all the truth. It is the truth. Right. My initial response was not to pray. It was to slay. And it wasn't slaying no demons. It was slaying the people. OK, so we're going to we just going to call the spade a spade. Right. But when I started, when I actually started to reprioritize and say even me taking those actions, me getting drunk because I was upset or me just, you know, doing whatever because I was so hurt. That was a symptom of me idolizing this relationship over myself and over my relationship with God. So I had to repent for that. So if you're trying to get out, you need to reprioritize. That person should no longer be your number one in any way. If you keep finding yourself thinking about them, you have to find a new way of thinking. And how do you do that? By meditating on the word of God. One of the things that I did during that season, I believe it really broke some things off of me. Every single chance I got, I call this in my um, ebook, Crowned in the Closet, plug, OK, click the link, go to my website, www.ashleyvon.org and purchase that ebook because it's a whole step process on what I did to get out of that toxic relationship. OK, you can go to my website to grab that. So I, I have what I call a prophetic theme song. My prophetic theme song was He Knows My Name by Tasha Cobbs Leonard. He knows my name. I played that song every single minute of the day that I could. Why? Did you know that music, right? Music has the ability to play particular spirits off of you. That's why, you know, when, when, David, when David, he played for Saul, he played a spirit off of him because, uh, you know, music or worship rather is a tool of, uh, to, to invoke the presence of God. And so even if you don't have the words to say because you're so heartbroken or um, even if you you just don't know what to do. Right. That prophetic theme song right there. Oh, my goodness. It started to help recalibrate this mind because I was in a relationship with someone who kept telling me that nobody loves you. Everyone thinks that you're crazy. No one wants to be around you. Um no one will want you after, you know, anyone, nobody will want you when I leave you, you know, all these types of things. And it, it plays on your psyche. Imagine being married and having children for someone who inherently hates you, hates your guts and does not want to be, want you to be successful. That is a lot to your mind. So the first thing you're trying to get out, start feeding your brain the right thing. Remember your brain, your mind is a seat of your appetite. You are addicted to something that's not good for you. And so now you need a new appetite. Your new appetite needs to be worship. Your new appetite needs to be prayer. Your new appetite needs to be affirmations. Your new appetite needs to be working out. Trauma lives in your body. You need to work out that stuff off of your body. Okay. Brittany says, weigh the risk and reward for staying. I did that. Brit I'm going to tell you this exercise, right? That I had did. And I, it didn't even hit me until my God. Right. They tell everybody else they love you. By, behind the doors, they hate you. They hate your, your natural guts, okay? Your natural and your supernatural guts. They hate both of them, all right? So we talked about you got you to gotta get a new appetite in this mind. 
Okay, Van, she said she had to start talking, letting people know because he wanted, yes, he wanted me to be quiet about what I've been through. So I did for eight months, amen. So the first thing I did, I agree with Van. I started to develop a new appetite through worship, through playing that same song. So when he was doing stuff, you know, purposely ignoring Mother's Day to try to hurt my feelings, he knows my name. Sometimes I would just break out into a praise. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for blessing me. Whenever he would try to start an argument, I would start praying out loud. Guess how long, guess how long that argument left, lasted? He argued with himself for about 15 to 30 seconds and left. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Right? Uh, Maya said her prophetic theme song is My Hands Are Lifted Up and God Is. Y'all put your prop. What are y'all theme songs? A prophetic theme song is a song that reminds you of the promise that God made to you. And it, and it really attacks what the devil is trying to tell you. So because, you know, in my relationship, in my marriage, I kept being told that I was nothing. I was nobody. Nobody loved me. And every day I kept hearing, he knows my name. The God of the universe knows my name. Oh, how he walks with me. Oh, how he talks with me. Oh, how he tells me I am his own man. He knows my name. It was nothing that, it was like, that song was so engraved in my spirit. It didn't matter what was being done. He knows my name. Yes, yeah, Sierra said all of you. But if they hate, um, hey, Rochelle, how are you? Thanks for jumping on. Again, we're answering some questions here. Um, someone asked a question around um, what do you do or how do you, um, what are some of the processes that you take in order to uh, break free from um, this type of toxic uh, relationship? And the first thing I talked about was how your mind, one of the definitions of mind is your seat of the appetite according to the word of God. And so in order for you to actually develop a new appetite because abuse is addictive, um, and so in order for you to develop a new appetite where we're talking about the use of a prophetic theme song, right? A song that reminds you of God's promises to you in order to help kind of recalibrate your thought process, increasing your appetite for the things of God. And then once you are strengthened in your spirit, you'll be able to make more sound decisions, such as creating boundaries and keeping them as it relates to these toxic folks. And now people are just sharing in the chat what their prophetic theme songs are. Um, I said mine was He Knows My Name by Tasha's, Tasha Cobbs Leonard. That was a song that really got me out of the lowest part of, um, of that toxic marriage. And now other people are saying, I raise a hallelujah. Uh, Laura said, no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I like that one. Um, Darlene says, it ain't over. Uh, Van says, I'll raise a hallelujah by Todd, Todd Galbert. Becky said, royalty. Royalty, Tasha Cobbs Litter has a lot of uh, 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 songs that help you recuperate and to recover. Yeah, she, she's, a, she's a recovery psalmist. So anything Tasha Cobbs, go ahead. Um, Kara said, um, this is Bless Me Tonight. I, I appreciate you for sharing. I have rehearsal. God bless you for rehearsal, Karen. Um, grace and peace. Amen. Um, Sierra says, yes, they hate all of you. That means they hate half of your children because yes, 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 yes. All of that. All right, beautiful people. I love you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for um, just rocking with me today. Again, uh, this live was all about the top three types of women that narcissistic preachers target. And we define a narcissistic preacher is different than a narcissistic Christian because every preacher is not a Christian. I'll say it again. Every preacher is not a Christian. And so we've decide, defined a narcissistic preacher as a person who preaches sermons as a means to seduce, charm, and manipulate others using false doctrine with an outcome that is related to self-interest. We define that utilizing scriptures. We talked about flattery, all of that. We, we, uh, what do we, we noted a uh, second Peter two and one Galatians five, 16 through 26 Hebrews 10 and 26. And the three types of women that narcissistic preachers often target are the church girl, the perfectionist and the wayward. If you missed uh, this, because you're just jumping on, do yourself a favor and go back and watch the replay. And I'll let you know, I, it's going to be up for 24 hours. Then it's coming down. 
okay, it's coming down every 24 hours. So I would admonish you all to go ahead and look at and listen to the replay, uh, you know, drop some notes down, gather your notes, your content, your everything. Okay. Again, if you've just seen me for the first time, my name is Ashley Yvonne. I'm the founder of a movement entitled Drop Everything and Pray, where we change our lives by acting boldly in prayer. I am also a Christian life coach. I specialize in helping faith-based women take a stand against narcissistic abuse using prayer. And so if you would have rock with me, get on my email list, you know, go to my website, www.ashleyvon.org. If you're on Facebook, it's going on there. Yeah, you can you can join the email list. I would admonish you, one of the great resources that I have created and is available to you is my ebook. It's called Crowned in a Closet, Crowned in a Closet, Crowned in a Closet, because that's what I was, Crowned in a Closet. In a prayer closet, I got my crown back. Thanks be unto God. And so go ahead in that manual, you will learn the strategy that I utilize in order to break free from that toxic relationship. You get to see my personal um, prophetic theme song list in, is in there. Something called the brain baptism concept is in there. I walk you through that explicitly. I even towards the latter part of that manual teach you how to tell your story in a way that is empowering in order to start an online business. Just a little, I'm planting a little seed about entrepreneurship just at the end of the text, uh, but the vast majority of it is dedicated to prayer and how to um, really get your power back through prayer. I love y'all. Hey, Aunt Tanya, I love y'all. I love y'all. If this resonated with you, if I said something that got your life all the way together, do me a favor, send me a DM. I want to hear about it. I mean, seriously, I want to hear about it. If you tried anything that I've suggested on this live, I want to hear about it. If you purchase the ebook and you try out some of the things in there and it gets your life together, baby, I want to hear about it. Do me a favor, go to my website. If you're on Instagram, just click the link in my bio, go to my website, scroll down, and you will see the link for the ebook. If you are here on um, Facebook, you can just go ahead to the website. I'm going to pin it right here for you all. Uh, I can actually pin it both ways, but let me just get my life together. So let me pin this right here, right here, right here, right here. Uh, I also come on to uh, Facebook Live and I pray every single Thursday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and so if you want to join me for prayer in just a little bit, you can do so. I'll be right back on uh, Facebook uh, to drop everything and pray. I love you all. Go to my website and I will talk to you soon. Bye bye. OK, let me end me over here. And I'm ending over here. Yes, end me. Bye, y'all.